welcome to episode 24 of the AMT podcast. Hope you guys have been crushing it as usual. It's been a very mediocre or even subpar week for me on the trading front. Now I find one of the biggest profit killers in this game is boredom. The racing was so dire last week. There were literally only two race cards on at the start of the week with only three to four runners in most races. Now I had the itch to bet on things which I had absolutely no business being involved in. And I ended up trying to scalp some football matches. Long story short, I got absolutely slaughtered and ended up giving most of my racing profits back. Now granted, it wasn't the biggest week, but when you tally up all those one-off bad decisions that led to unnecessary losses, you'll be horrified as to how much money you've needlessly thrown away at the end of the year. One bad loss is bad enough in and of itself, but it's actually the ripple effect that it causes which does the most damage. What happens is you end up finding yourself battling with your emotions, having to resist the urge of not trying to revenge trade and make, make it back in the very next trade. And if you do succumb to the greed, you may get away with it once, a few times even, but it always catches up and it's a slippery slope. Trust me, I've been down that road. One of the hardest parts of trading is the come down period after a long sustained run of profitability. It kind of feels like pulling the handbrake up when driving in fifth gear. You've been betting all week or all month and then suddenly there's nothing that fits your criteria or there's just no market on to trade. And those are the times your metal is truly tested. We're all human at the end of the day. We all experience a wide spectrum of emotions. Sometimes we allow certain triggers to evoke the incorrect emotional response and we end up making mistakes that we know we shouldn't have made. And if you find this has ever happened to you, and in all likelihood it has or it will at some point, then make it a habit to write down, journal, and contemplate what prompted you to behave so irrationally in the first place. If you do make the effort to take that time out and write down what happened and why it happened, then you become more self-aware and understanding of your nature and your character and you're far less likely to do it again. Trading is only as hard as you make it, and there's nothing more destructive or wasteful than making the same mistakes over and over again. Anyway, without digressing further, today I want to talk about last week's circus. Yes, I'm talking about the Jake Paul-Tommy Fury fight. Now, this is the first time I've ever tuned into one of these influencer, YouTuber spectacles, or whatever you call it. Now, the first time this happened, I think it was between KSI and Joe Weller. KSI beat the out of him and ended up calling out the Paul brothers and ended up fighting Logan. Eddie Hearn, who put on the show, swore up and down that this was a one-off event in order to attract a new, younger uh, gaming generation to the sport of boxing. Yet it turned out that the fight was a financial success with pay-per-view numbers comparable to some of the biggest fights that year. If it makes money, it makes sense. And from there, I knew this wasn't going to be the last time we hear from these guys. Lo and behold, six years on, there's been like a dozen of these garbage influencer so-called fights. This rubbish has even infiltrated the zone, which is supposedly a premium boxing service where you pay a subscription every month in order to watch fights, real fights, that is. Since quality matchups are so rare these days in boxing, we're now having this influencer garbage rammed down our throats. The only reason why this influencer matchmaking has gotten the traction it has is because boxing has become so fractured. Promoters, managers, networks, all refusing to work with each other for the sake of not risking their prized assets' precious zero on their record. The Mayweather-Pacquiao fight which was supposedly the biggest fight of the century, took 10 years to make for these very reasons, amongst others pertaining to contract negotiations. And when they did finally come to a deal, there were two ring announcers, one from Showtime and one from HBO, simply because they couldn't agree on which network was going to have the ring MC. Boxing was never like this. It was only 20 years ago when the heavyweight division was stacked. Everyone fought everyone. No belt was held to ransom. Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield, Lennox Lewis, Oliver McCall, Hasim Rockman, Frank Bruno, Shannon Briggs, Vitaly Klitschko, just to name a few. The heavyweight title switched hands so many times because everyone fought everyone. That way we can look back on that era and there's virtually no argument as to who the best was. Legacy and greatness for a long time was measured by the quality of opposition and how frequently a fighter fought and defended his title. Today, the focus has shifted 
to who can make the most money with the least amount of work and stay undefeated. I've lost count as to how many world champions there are today who are undefeated. Not because they're unbeatable, but because they cherry pick and don't fight anybody and they fight only once or twice a year. And I believe there's one person who's almost solely responsible for this shift and that's none other than Floyd Mayweather. Now before you jump down my throat, I agree that Floyd is arguably one of the best fighters ever. He's my favorite fighter ever and probably the best technical fighter you'll ever see. However, as great of a fighter as he is, his arch rival and nemesis of this generation, Manny Pacquiao, has the greatest resume ever in the history of boxing. You can literally split his career into three different resumes and they'll all be arguably Hall of Fame careers. I don't want to delve too deep into that discussion. Maybe I'll do so for another video. But whether you like it or not, Floyd's business decisions have affected his legacy. Whether he did it knowingly or not, he has set a new precedent for when it comes to cherry picking, fighting the right guy at the right time for the right price. The Mayweather Pacquiao fight took 10 years to make for crying out loud. Gone are the days when you could just call someone out and have a throwdown. Now they have to speak to their manager or their promoter or their network or whichever men are hiding behind the smoke screen. The best no longer fight the best and when it does happen, it's nearly always almost too late. Now some may rightfully argue that they're prize fighters who should milk their careers for all it's worth given it's such a dangerous and short-lived endeavor. And I 100% agree and empathize with that sentiment. However, there is a price to pay when it comes to legacy. If you are going to throw your name in the hat of the greatest of all time, then you have to have at least fought or beat the best fighters of your generation. Tyson Fury, for example, I'm starting to hear his name being bandied around in the all-time great conversation. And whilst he has every chance of being in that conversation, he has to have at least fought everyone in this era. As impressive and incredible as his comeback to the top of the sport has been, just a little digging and you'll see on his resume that there's only two world champions on there. And by the way, he won his first title in an absolute stinker. Granted, he was a big underdog, but no one really remembers that fight. And then he went on to beat Deontay Wilder twice, a guy who's only got one ch world champion, a paper champion at that on his record. This isn't to discredit Tyson Fury or Deontay Wilder's abilities, but context is important. These are two of supposedly the best heavyweights on the world, and they only have around two or three real names on their resume. Now bear in mind, Tyson Fury's net worth is around 130 million pounds. He has set his family and future generations up for eternity. But for a guy who supposedly calls himself the people's champ and doesn't care about money, he nearly always prizes himself out when it comes to fighting Anthony Joshua and Alexander Usyk, two of the other best fighters of this era in the heavyweight division. Again, I don't want to delve into a discussion about whose fault it is that these fights haven't happened because it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, people are going to look back on this generation and not care as to whose fault it was. All they're going to say is they didn't fight. The point I'm making here is that as a boxing fan, we have to wait years to get the matchups that we crave. And it was just a matter of time before a rival product would come along and steal their slice of the attention. Namely the UFC, a place where the best mixed martial artists in the world are all signed to one organization. No running, no hiding, no endless calling each other out for years, only for the fight not to happen. The best fight the best, there's no hiding. When Dana White says, you're up next, you're going to fight or you're out. Boxing has become its own worst enemy. And this gaping hole with regards to quality matchups are now being filled with this influencer garbage. Now, when it comes to Jake Paul and Tommy Fury, I have to admit, I was intrigued. Now, I follow boxing a lot and Jake Paul has done a damn good job of convincing us all that he's become a full-fledged athlete who's taking boxing seriously with real ambitions of becoming a world champion. And he seemingly does work hard. And to his credit, he has got an arguably better resume than most professional fighters at that young stage of their career. A lot of critics have insisted that he would fold against a real professional fighter. So naturally, I was intrigued when he was matched up with Tommy Fury, especially when Jake opened up as the favorite with the bookies. Now, whilst Tommy is a professional and he's from a historic bloodline and has been boxing from a young age, he has a rather unimpressive resume as a professional fighter. I felt like this was the perfect matchup for Jake. A lot of unknowns and the chance to have a, a famous albeit novice pro boxer on his record. Not only would he silence a lot of critics, but he would have officially entered the WBC world rankings with a chance of lining himself up with a fight against some serious contenders. And who knows where that story arc could have ended up. Dare I say it, had he kept progressing and landed himself a world title shot, 
It could have been one of the greatest sporting stories of all time. A Disney YouTuber kid turned boxing world champion. And I got to admit, these guys pulled an absolute blinder because the fight was bull****. Jake has no lateral movement. He can't close the distance, couldn't establish range. He was slow. And to Tommy's credit, who I've never seen fight before, boxed the absolute ears off of him. He was genuinely sold. I fell for it. Whilst Tommy Fury was gallivanting on reality TV and Jake Paul was training like a tro Trojan and fighting regularly, I thought he had a genuine shot at winning. At least I got to see for myself the golfing class between somebody who's been schooled in the fundamentals from a young age and somebody who's only just taken it up a couple of years ago. I don't think it's impossible, but it was certainly a steep mountain to climb. Whilst I do have respect for Jake's dedication and application to the sport, guys like him and KSI would be smart to never entertain the idea of fighting a professional again. I think these influencer matchups do have a place. At the end of the day, it brings in an audience, it makes money, and attracts a whole new demographic to the sport. But it's only entertaining when these guys fight each other. These guys would literally be risking their lives if they ever fought anyone at British or European level. We live in strange times. I never thought the day would come where we'd be having a conversation about YouTubers fighting boxers professionally. The future's a forever changing mosaic. And at this rate, literally nothing is off the table. Boxing has done this to itself. Years of failing to give the fans what they want. We're now being made to feel appreciative for whatever crap they try and sell us. The only way this is going to stop is if we stop tuning in to these phony matchups. You vote with your money. If we collectively stopped paying for these ridiculous matchups like Tommy Fury, Jake Paul, or Floyd Mayweather against Logan Paul, or even Tyson Fury, Derek Chisora, then these fighters and their respective networks are going to be forced into a corner and will have to give us the fights that we want. Anyway, this is something I really wanted to vent about for a while. So let me know your thoughts. You think this influencer boxing thing has a place? Do you think boxing is as fractured as I make it out to be? Write your opinions in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think. And of course, don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you guys in the next video.